Now it's my honor and privilege to introduce, once again, our presenter for this evening, Katie Carlson. Katie serves as the Director of Wellness Initiatives for the Marion County Sheriff's Office in Indianapolis, Indiana. She is responsible for the implementation, execution, and oversight of the Marion County Sheriff's Office wellness programs. She also serves as the coordinator of the MCSO peer support team. Earlier this year, Katie was honored with the Emerging Leader in Crisis Intervention Award from the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation for her work in peer support and holistic wellness for public safety personnel. Congratulations, Katie. Before assuming her current role, she served as the public information officer for Marion County Sheriff's Office for nearly eight and a half years. Katie Carlson is a certified yoga teacher through City Yoga there in Indianapolis. She was certified in 2019 and is a certified mindfulness teacher through the Engaged Mindfulness Institute and received that certification in 2022. Katie teaches yoga and mindfulness meditation to law enforcement, corrections and public safety personnel, to inmates in the county's adult detention center, as well as for members of her Garfield Park community in Indianapolis. Katie is a writer and frequent presenter on topics of yoga, mindfulness, and public safety. So Katie, welcome again. We're excited to have you. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you everybody for the opportunity to present on tonight's call for the 25th time. Um, when I teach yoga classes to public safety personnel, I often begin by sharing some misconceptions of a yoga practice. Some of those misconceptions include that one must be flexible to do yoga or that yoga consists of twisting your body into tricky configurations. Other common misperceptions include that yoga is done solely in a yoga studio or even worse, in a studio with the temperature set at 100 degrees for hot yoga. But even among yogis with years of experience, misperception can remain. Primarily that yoga is a series or a flow of physical postures. In reality, yoga or in actuality, yoga is so much more than the physical postures that you might see when you Google the word yoga or even what you might experience by attending a yoga class. In some of my previous presentations, I have shared concepts of yoga's philosophy, including the yama, which can be described as ethical guidelines or guides for interacting with uh, the world and other people, and the niyama, which provide a construct for internal action and growth. The yama and the niyama are the first two of Pantanjali's Eightfold Path to Liberation in the Yoga Sutras, often called the Eight Limbs of Yoga. The third limb is asana, and asana contains the physical postures that we think of when we think about a yoga practice. While the third limb of asana contains advanced postures like handstands and backbends, the word itself translates to the physical posture of sitting. I'll share a sneak peek into the fourth through the eighth limbs of yoga before we settle back into the third limb, asana, for the rest of this presentation. The fourth limb is pranayama or breathing techniques. Hey, we know those. Um, the fifth limb is pratyahara or the withdrawal of the senses. The sixth limb is dharana, focused concentration. Now, is this just me or is this starting to sound like mindfulness? The seventh limb is dhyana or uh, meditative absorption, and the eighth and final limb is samadhi or enlightenment. So going back, yoga begins with the foundation of the yama and the niyama, how we treat ourselves and how we treat other people and beings. And then it shifts into the third limb of asana, physical postures to help the body prepare for breathwork and meditation. 
as I teach yoga and mindfulness meditation to public safety personnel, I always recommend physical movement, be it yoga or other exercise prior to meditation. Though it is not always possible or necessary, moving helps to prepare our body to settle into a comfortable seated position. And I'll joke with the uh, incoming recruits uh, that the worst time to meditate would be directly following a two hour criminal law class. And these aren't just recommendations that I'm giving, but they're a part of my own daily practice. So going back to the misperception that yoga is just a series of postures and poses, and with the foundation that the physical postures in a yoga practice make up only a single, although much overemphasized in Western culture aspect of yoga, it's with a little bit of irony that tonight I'll be presenting on an aspect of yoga philosophy mostly, but not exclusively associated with the limb of asana or yoga postures. In mindfulness teacher training, Dr. Maul would often refer to his own teacher, Trumpa Rinpoche, and the term taking your seat. Each time we lead a meditation practice, we teachers will encourage the participants to find a seat that is both comfortable and upright, or to sit with a natural sense of dignity. Dr. Maul would also refer to the teachings of sitting with a strong back and a soft front. The soft front, heart open to the world around us, and a strong back with good posture and alignment. When beginning a yoga practice, there can be a lot of discomfort in sitting still with a strong back and good posture and alignment. The muscles in our back must be trained to sit with steadiness and ease. Out of hundreds and hundreds of yoga postures, varying from modified postures in a chair to advanced postures, the only alignment cues that are offered in the Yoga Sutra are this. The posture should be steady and comfortable, or sira and sukha. Sira meaning steadiness, stability, and strength, and sukha meaning comfort, ease, and openness. In a beginner's yoga practice, one might make their way into a tree pose. We find sira, this steadiness and strength in tree pose, by grounding our foot into the floor, stabilizing the balancing leg, and then pressing our other foot into our ankle, our calf, or our thigh. We find sukha by releasing our shoulders away from our ears and down into our back. We find Sira by focusing on a spot in front of us that doesn't move, helping us to keep steady in our balance. And then we find Sukha by softening our self-talk, not beating ourselves up over a wobbly tree or comparison, comparing ourselves um, to the person that's in front of us. Recently, I set an intention to bring more attention to Sira and Sukha in my life. And like the third limb of yoga, asana, my intention was geared toward my physical body. As I've mentioned a few times in these calls in the past year, I've picked up the hobby of bouldering or uh, indoor climbing without rope. I can't say for sure whether it's my new hobby in which I've already sprained my ankle or the recent eight foot fall I took landing mostly on my neck, luckily on a kind of soft cushion um, or just the natural process of aging. But for the first time in my life, I'm experiencing more daily pain. Walking around with more pain in more places than I was used to, I developed a lot more empathy for folks who have been suffering for chronic, from chronic pain. Around the time I set my intention to include more Sira and Sukha or to be more attentive to Sira and Sukha, the pain that I was experiencing was the kind of pain that made it hard to think about anything else, the kind of pain that just made you grumpy. And this was a first for me. So I knew that my body was calling for a different approach, both strength and ease. I have kept up with my daily workouts and climbing, but I purchased a $50 shiatsu neck and shoulder massager and a deep tissue leg roller. In yoga, we are able to find the steadiness and ease of each pose. 
Sometimes this means taking another variation of a pose. I often call out, especially while leading a class through tree pose, that there is no hierarchy of tree poses. A tree pose with your toes planted and your foot pressing against the ankle of your balancing leg is not a lesser quality of, or value than a tree pose with your foot pressing firmly inside of your upper thigh and your arms reached out overhead. Not only is there no hierarchy of tree poses, but there's no hierarchy of yoga poses. The quality and value of each pose lie not in its complexity, but in our ability to find sira and sukha, steadiness and ease in the posture. So too does this apply to climbing or any other physical practice. When I dedicate an entire climbing session to challenging climbs that I struggle to complete, when I focus only on Sira, I'll stop climbing early and tell myself, well, at least I came. I'll say, um, but, but that's almost like going to a weightlifting session dedicated only to deadlifting an amount of weight that you aren't able to pick up and walking away from the workout without completing any reps. We have to create space for ease and comfort in our practices. We have to allow our physical practices to meet us where we are and not where we would like to be. Mindfulness and meditation, I tell new law enforcement recruits, is not about being the best meditator, and it's not about having the most focused attent concentration. It's about understanding which things in life are truly worthy of our attention, recognizing when our attention and energy have slipped away from what's truly important, and bringing our attention and energy back to what matters. Those of us on this call know that that takes practice. It takes repetition. It means taking our seat over and over and over again. It means finding a posture that feels both uplifted and comfortable, whether our version of sitting means toning over time, the muscles in our back, or whether we're using a chair or cushion for support. It means that there's no hierarchy of seated postures. Like climbs are graded and weights are labeled, but repetition is repetition. In climbing, I'm learning that on the days that it feels extremely hard and extra challenging, that I can do just as much to support my practice, my strength, and my endurance by focusing on the climbs that I can do with each, by balancing Sira and Sukha in my climbing practice as well as any other physical practices. As we move into a seated yoga practice followed by a meditation practice, I'll invite you several times to notice the parts of your practice, but not limited to, um, especially within our own bodies, where we notice and rebalance Sira and Sukha. I've prepared discussion questions related to our experience of Sira and Sukha in our physical and meditative practices, as well as other aspects of our lives. So let's begin our practice by finding a posture that feels both uplifted and comfortable. Let me scoop my chair back just a little bit. Um, So finding that posture that feels both uplifted and comfortable, allowing our hands to perhaps come to the tops of our knees. We'll start to connect with our breath, finding an even breath at first. So an even breath in and an even breath out. This might mean bringing a count to the breath, maybe counting in four and counting out four. But just noticing our lungs as they fill with air and noticing the air as it works its way through our body. Using a little leverage from our knees with our next inhale, I'll invite you to bring your chest forward and lift your head up towards the ceiling without straining your neck. And as we exhale, starting to round our back and release our head down towards our neck. So we find a stretch in our back and our shoulders. So we'll inhale, coming forward, lifting our head. Exhale, rounding our back, releasing our chin to our chest. And we're going to do this about four more times, the seated cat cow pose. And again, bringing that invitation back to just feel the muscles in your body as they work, noticing the points 
that feel like work, that feel like steadiness, that feel like stretching. And the parts that just feel good and comfortable and easy. You may notice several different sensations moving along your spine and through your shoulders and your neck as we warm up our spine in this seated cat-cow pose. I'm taking about one more round of cat-cow, coming back to a seated upright posture with your next inhale. We'll start to lift our arms up overhead, breathing in. And as we exhale, we're gonna bring our right hand down by our side and extend the left arm up and over our body. I'm not sure which way I'm showing. So if it, you, you, it doesn't really matter which way you start. We just wanna bring that um, along extra length into our side here. And you can use the side of your chair. But once we find this posture, we wanna connect with our breath. Again, noticing where we're working and where we're resting. You may notice some rest and ease in the opposite shoulder and tension in the shoulder that's extended up and over our body. With our next inhale, we'll lift our arms back up overhead. And as we exhale, we'll bring the other hand down to the side of our chair and extend the other arm up and over. Reconnecting with our breath, taking those full breaths in, long, slow breaths out. Again, scanning your body, just noticing the different sensations that arise with this posture, the parts that of our body that feel like they're working, that feel steady, feel like they're holding us up and the parts that feel soft. And with our next inhale, we'll start to lift our arm back up overhead. This time as we exhale, we're gonna to twist to one side. So I'm gonna bring my left hand outside of my right knee and I'm gonna bring my right hand to the top of my chair, but the hand can also come down to the seat of your chair. So it's just totally up to you and the chair that you're in. But we wanna turn our head to look out over the shoulder where our hand is on the chair or at our seat and reconnect with our breath, taking those full breaths in and long, slow breaths out. Another big breath in. A long, slow breath out. And with our next inhale, lifting our arms up overhead and exhale, twisting over to the opposite side. So bringing the other hand outside of the other leg, bringing the other hand to either the top of the chair or the base of the chair, whatever you did on the other side, turning your head to look out over the other shoulder and connecting with our breath, feeling our breath move through our body, noticing places of ease and places of steadiness, strength. With our next inhale, we'll lift our arms back up overhead. And as we exhale, we'll float our arms down by our side. As we breathe in, we'll lift our shoulders up to our ears. And as we breathe out, we're gonna let our shoulders roll down our back. So we take about three shoulder rolls, breathing in and breathing out. And with each inhale, we may feel the tension we bring into our shoulders as we lift them up to our ears. And with each exhale, just Noticing the release in our shoulders as they come down our back, taking about one more shoulder roll going backwards, eventually releasing your shoulders completely, letting them come all the way back to a neutral position. With our next inhale, lifting our shoulders back up to our ears, this time rounding them forward and down. So we reverse the direction of the shoulder rolls. Staying connected with our breath and our movement, breathing in as we lift the shoulders up, breathing out as we release the shoulders down. Taking about one more shoulder roll going this direction. And then releasing your shoulders completely, letting them come all the way back to neutral. Next, we'll bring our chin down to our chest. As we breathe in, we're gonna roll one ear over to one shoulder. And as we breathe out, we'll roll back down through center. Breathing in, rolling the other ear over to the other side. 
breathing out, coming back down through center. Breathing in the other ear to the other side. Breathing out, coming back down through center. One more, the second round on the second side. And breathing out, coming back down through center. And if you've gotten an even number of rolls to each shoulder, just pausing for a moment with your chin at your chest before slowly rolling your head back up to a neutral position. From here, we're going to uh, I recommend scooting towards the edge of the chair so that you can plant your feet firmly into the ground. We can start with our hands on our lap, but we're gonna breathe in and lift our arms up and over our head, looking at our fingertips as they touch. And as we breathe out, we're gonna start to fold over our body and this fold can look totally different for everybody. We just wanna release our head and release our neck. So maybe you can fold all the way down onto your legs. Maybe you use your legs for support. We just wanna let our head hang and our neck hang, it might feel good to gently shake your head no or gently nod your head yes. And with our next breath in, we'll start to slowly roll back up, allowing our head to be the last to rise. We're gonna do that two more times. So grounding our feet into the floor, finding all four corners of our feet, our toes, heels, side to side, bringing our arms out by our side, lifting our arms up overhead, looking at our fingertips as they touch, and then breathing out and folding over our legs and whatever kind of forward fold feels comfortable and supportive in your body, staying connected to our breath. Even in this forward fold, noticing any struggle or challenge to our breath, making its usual way through our body with this position. Again, you can always keep your arms on your legs, just letting your head hang and your neck hang, breathing in and out. And with our next breath in, slowly rolling up, allowing your head to be the last to rise. One more time, bringing our hands back down by our side, finding all four corners of our feet, our toes, our heels, Side to side, this time we'll breathe in, lifting our shoulders up to our ears and breathe out, letting our shoulders come down into our back. Breathing in, lifting our arms up overhead, looking at our fingertips as they touch. Breathing out, folding over our legs and whatever forward fold works the best for your body. Whatever forward fold feels the best right now, just staying connected to the breath and the movement. Noticing parts of your body that are working and parts of your body that are relaxing. And with your next inhale, slowly rolling back up to a neutral seated position. From here, we're gonna take a seated version of tree pose. So I'm gonna move my screen down just a little bit so you can see um one one option so if you'd like you can keep your um foot planted and the other foot at your ankle um so we've got our we'll start planting our right foot in the floor and then planting the um left foot into our ankle you can also bring your left foot you can scoot back into your chair and bring your left foot into your thigh so those are two, you can keep your foot on the ground or you can bring your foot into your thigh on your chair. But eventually finding this alignment through our hips and our shoulders, we're gonna lift our arms up overhead and looking forward this time, connecting with our breath, lowering our shoulders so they come away from our ears. Maybe pressing our foot into our ankle, pressing the standing leg into the ground, feeling that connection, that work to the floor, that strength in our arms, yet the ease in the back of our shoulders as we release them. And with our next exhale, we'll bring everything through down, through our center and down, and then we'll switch out our legs. So same thing on this side, coming to the edge so we can plant our foot. If you're keeping your um, foot at your ankle, 
sitting back in your seat. If you're bringing your foot into your thigh, pressing the standing leg into the floor, pressing your foot into your thigh or your ankle, breathing in, lifting your arms up overhead, lowering your shoulders down into your back, grounding your foot into the floor, your other foot into your leg, into your calf, your thigh, wherever that is. And with our next exhale, bringing everything through center and down. Bringing that first leg back over, if it's comfortable, crossing it on top of the um, other leg. And you can also cross your legs down um, at the floor too. So just taking a crossed position um, that feels good. We're going to take a seated, um, a, a seated pose here where we stretch out our back. So once again, we're going to lift our arms up overhead. And as we exhale this time, we're going to fold over our legs. So this time we may notice a little bit more of a stretch in the back of our thigh of the leg that's folded. We may notice that pressure into the floor where our other leg is planted. Staying connected to the breath, breathing as we just let our body fall over our bent leg. Releasing our head, releasing our neck, feeling these areas of softness and the areas of connection and grounding and steadiness. With our next inhale, slowly rolling back up. And switching legs, coming over to the other side. So you can cross your legs down at your ankles. You can cross your leg on top of your thigh. Breathing in, lifting your arm up, so arms up overhead, breathing out, folding over your leg in any way that's comfortable. Just releasing your head and releasing your neck. Staying connected to your breath, noticing the points of contact that your body's making with the floor, with the seat the strength, the steadiness in your, in your thighs and the ease perhaps of releasing your head and your neck, just letting your head hang here. Staying connected with the breath. With our next inhale, we'll slowly roll back up. We'll uncross our legs. And from here, we'll start to move into a meditation practice. So again, finding our, our seat, noticing any different sensations that we may feel in our body now, having moved, having brought some strength and ease into our body, Sira and Sukha. We can just let our hands fall wherever they feel the most comfortable. You've got the option to keep your eyes open. Um, if you keep your eyes open, the recommendation would be to cast your gaze down towards the floor or a wall so we're not staring directly at a screen. You can also just allow your eyes to close. Let's we'll start to notice our breath without making any changes to our breath at first. And we may notice that it is a little hard to notice our breath without making any changes to it. We almost naturally want to bring a rhythm to the breath as we bring awareness to it. But just beginning to notice the sensations of the breath as we breathe in, the sensations of our breath filling our lungs and the sensations of the breath as we breathe out. And we'll begin this mindfulness practice with the sensations of our breath, following the entire body of the breath. So noticing the sensations of coolness as the breath comes in through your nose and parted lips. The sensation of coolness as the 
breath hits the back of the throat. Sensation of expansion with each inhale in our lungs, in our chest, and in our rib cage. And the sensation of contraction with our exhale in our lungs, chest, and rib cage, following the breath all the way out of the body. Perhaps noticing that sensation of warmth as it leaves. So following the entire body of the breath. Noticing these different points. Like that point of fullness where our lungs feel at full capacity. The sensations associated with that point of emptiness between two breaths. And just allowing yourself to become curious about these sensations. Perhaps bringing a phrase into this practice repeating silently to ourselves that this is what it feels like to breathe in and this is what it feels like to breathe out. And as we breathe in and we breathe out, bringing Sira, Sukha and Sukha to mind, we may notice parts of our breath that feel like work, drawing in our muscles. And we may notice parts of our breath that feel like relaxation as we can just release our muscles, allowing the breath to leave our body. So just allowing ourselves to become curious about the breath, curious about the sensations of steadiness and ease as they arise and fall. Then we'll start to bring our attention to the bottoms of our feet. Perhaps with the ability to plant our feet into the ground and noticing the connection between our feet and the floor. Maybe finding all four corners of that, the feet, even pushing into the feet to feel that stronger sense of stability, just to get a sense of the strength in our legs and in our feet and in our muscles. Keeping this awareness of our feet planting into the floor, moving up through our body, noticing the sensations in our ankles as we firmly plant our feet, the engagement of our calves, as we plant our feet into the ground, the bend of our knees, and beginning to notice the points of contact between our body and our seat. We may notice this sense of gravity holding us down in our seat, keeping us from floating off into space. But again, I'd bring encourage attention to go to these almost contrasting sensations of our feet planted into the floor and then this point of ease where the chair starts to take the weight of our body giving us an opportunity to relax noticing these points of contact between our body and the chair 
We may let our attention move through our hips to our lower back. And if it's comfortable, then perhaps readjusting that position of feeling both comfortable and uplifted. Noticing those sensations, the engagement of the muscles that keep us in this upright position. Noticing any sense of tire. Or maybe we just feel good. Just paying particular mind to these sensations in our back, holding our body, holding our torso up. So for about the next minute or so, I'm going to drop any instruction in the mindfulness practice and just encourage to notice the sensations of Sierra and Sukha in the different places in your body as we sit in this somewhat basic seated posture, this asana. Noticing tire, micro muscle movements readjustments, whatever, whatever the seat looks like for you, whatever that comfortable seat is, that uplifted seat is for you, and whatever associations they are with them, just allowing yourself to become curious. So I'll drop instruction now and then begin again in about a minute. in a way that's similar than to what we've closed before, but a little bit different too. I just um, offer the encouragement or the suggestion if it feels comfortable to squeeze all the muscles in the lower part of your body, squeezing your legs, squeezing your buttocks on the chair, squeezing your toes and your feet, and just squeezing the bottom half of your body as hard as you can, just squeezing it, squeezing it, hold, hold, hold and then release and just feel all of your muscles and body soften into the seat of your chair. Then perhaps bringing fists to your palms, squeezing the muscles of your arms and your chest and your back and your abs, these muscles we've just been paying attention to as they keep us seated upright, just squeezing these muscles and squeezing them and hold it and hold it and hold it and then release and just letting your palms fall open, softening your shoulders down into your back. And then finally, as if we just took a bite out of a lemon, making as tight a face as we can, making a tight face and hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, and then release 
Noticing the sensations of our jaw softening and of our brow softening. If your eyes are closed, you can start to bring them open. If it feels good to bring any other movement back into your body, maybe that's a twist, maybe that's a stretch, just inviting any kind of movement that would feel good. In this moment, as we come back together and if it's okay, I'd like to open up um, for some conversation about, um, I guess, maybe starting with uh, the practice um, in particular. If there were, you know, if there was any, if, if we you noticed um, places of the Sira and Sukha, noticing some of that um, strength and steadiness and, and places and softness, if there is um, anything that particularly stood out about the practice, and then we can maybe go to um, Sira and Sukha, the presentation, or just ask whatever, it doesn't really matter. Yes, Susan. When you were doing, um, put your head forward, my nose started running out of nowhere. <laughs> I don't even know what was happening. That's why I had to leave to go blow my nose. It just felt like my whole sinuses just uh, released. I don't know what to say, where it came from or anything. I'll put I my head forward. <laughs> well, I think it was a good thing, but I just put my head forward and it was like, what is happening? What's happening? But I feel better. And it kind of probably released a little kink in the back of my neck too. So um, it's very helpful. I don't normally do like the head one all the time, but probably needs it more regular. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Hi, Katie. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> that was very enjoyable. Thank you. The two seated, uh, well, we're all seated, but the forward bends, um, mm -hmm. the first and the second, interestingly enough, are two of the first two stages of Swarupa yoga, which is all about spinal release. Mm -hmm. And so the first is actually that forward bend with the feet planted is to release the tailbone. And then the next is actually the sacrum when we have the leg out to the side and the ankle on top of the thigh. So it was just, as one of my favorite practices. And so it's a, really a great practice. And they're, the actually a, the lunge is the third area. And then there's one more than one for the cervical spine, but they say, you know, a flexible spine is a flexible mind. So my mind's a little bit more flexible now. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't, I haven't heard of that um, type of yoga before. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, practice, all about spinal release. And um, <clears throat> most of us probably have no idea we have muscles attached to our tailbone. I certainly didn't. I practiced yoga for a very a number of years beforehand, <clears throat> but literally uh, doing that practice, uh, you could feel the muscles quivering at the tailbone. So it really begins to awaken uh, the, the muscles along the spine and also creating release of those muscles. It's a really uh, quite beautiful practice, very much in the restorative end of the continuum. When I teach, um, public safety personnel. And right now, you know, I, sometimes I'm teaching at our law enforcement training academy, the Indiana one. So there's 169 people in that current class and, you know, getting people in every single class, I, it doesn't matter if it's a class of detention deputies or that 169, getting people into that first forward fold. I mean, you just, you just hear, Oh, yeah. Like, I, I mean, there, there's so much sensation that's, um, you know, that really gets, especially that, that gets kind of stuck right there. And it's something that I try to work with, um, like our, the people at our sheriff's office and, and teach and share about often because it's not that hard to take, you know, you can take a minute and, and, and fold over, you know, I mean, and it, and it gives you so, there's so many benefits to just, to taking a forward fold 
and um, you know, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. It could be, you know, before you go to bed at night. And so, uh, yeah, we, I, I, I talk about, I focus on forward folds a lot in my practice with public safety. Yeah, what a wonderful practice for 911 call takers and dispatchers, by the way, that are sitting all the yeah. time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Katie, I, lo I love the practice and I found it quite challenging to, to look for the both the ease and the steadiness or the ease and the strength or the ease and the effort, you know, because generally the effort comes forefront, you know, so it's a bit of a search, right? It's a bit of an exploration looking for some, for some ease. I wonder if you have any further thoughts on how one directs their attention around to that. What did you find? Well, I didn't always find the ease part, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, habitually, I kind of, you know, really go for it, you know, whatever it is, it is, you know, so I kind of want to get the full whatever it is. So um, I really loved your, um, your talk about your climbing. Mm -hmm. and, and when it's not a day for super high effort climbing, that it's, it's really helpful, beneficial and completely okay to do low intensity climbing. Yeah, so so much better than not not at all, yeah. you know. Right. I, right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because in the practice, uh, where I feel the most ease is is just with the with the shoulder hang and with that sense of gravity, you know, this that that point where where the seat absorbs the weight of my body and um, you know, and, and my shoulders all almost feel heavy with 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 ease when when I was doing that to answer to answer your question that's where mm -hmm. that's that's where I find it the most in this well I'm wondering if if there is maybe there's an additional part if one's going into uh a, like if when we're going into these stretches does one then also sort of look for a place to release right so can you I mean this is clear I know I kind of I know where I'm going with that but then I could release my legs, right? And my rear end like that, or my toes, or, you know. Well, all kinds I, of things. what I think is beautiful about the practice is that, that what that thing is, I mean, if everyone's like, if you're like me and I'm like, okay, I can plant and I can twist halfway around, but that you can, you know, that, that maybe what that practice is, that, that there's just a different, you know, a, a different, degrees of, of twisting that and that mm -hmm. all of them are okay you know mm -hmm. that all of them are like wh whatever that is so um you know you may go into and I don't want to make any assumptions but you know you may kind of you're you're an athlete though John and so you know you may go into this practice with you know and kind of enjoy that sort of deep mm -hmm. st stretching mm -hmm. and 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 the you know in a sense that that ease kind of can can come is it, it's I'd say just as much it's a, a mental ease as it is and Richard I you know I'd be curious on on your take too but just as much of a mental ease you know when you're not like in this kind of constant state I think that the difference is, you know and and it's not even I don't even want to pick on um, you know advanced poses but there there are people I know my mom you know she went into a yoga class once down in florida and she walked in and there's like two guys in there and they're doing hand stand, head stands before class for five minutes for for you know and she it made her nervous she was just like oh gosh am i you know like you said this is beginner yoga you know like i mean this is like yoga for seniors so so you know it, it's the the just what that ease is is going to be different for everybody and so um yeah, I, I mean, I think that I think if it's a good twist, but you feel comfortable and it's not like your body's not screaming to get out of it. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you can, you know, do stuff. I could sit there and try to do a dancer, you know, pose all day long. And if I'm wobbling and I'm all over the place, then there's probably some poses, you know, I could probably spend a little bit more time in tree pose, um, building up that strength. 
um, in, in my leg before trying to advance it. So it's just, it's just kind of a matter of the, of a continuum of, of what that Sierra and Stuka is going to look like for everybody. And that's why it's the only, it's the only instruction offered, you know, well, all we think about, it blows my mind. All we think about are yoga poses. And yet that is it that in, in the, in the yoga sutras ease and ease and steadiness. So that's interesting. So it sounds like there can be ease. There can be ease within the effort, mm -hmm. right? They can be, right? They can be sort of a web. Mm -hmm. So I certainly feel that in some levels of, you know, intensity of workout, right? You're kind of at a tempo where you just keep going, right? And it's some yeah. effort, but it feels good. You just keep going. So an ease to it. So thank you, Katie. Katie, do you find when you teach maybe law enforcement specifically, but just people in general, there's a difficulty in grasping non-aggressiveness in practice? <laughs> I don't ever, I never want to seem like I'm making fun of, okay, I am. I'm just going to make fun of somebody, okay? Um, I'm sorry, you know, yo yoga, but I had, there was, I was teaching a class once and there was a guy who I had a crush on in high school who had sent me a message and was like, Hey, are you teaching today? I'm like, yeah. And he sh comes up to my class and this is just like an easy flow class. But the only yoga I think that he'd ever done is like hot power yoga. So everyone else in the class is kind of chilling out, doing a practice fairly similar to what I'm doing. And then there's this rant, this kind of random guy going, hoo -ah, hoo -ah, hoo -ah, like making, I mean, like making every, like doing like a triple, you know, vinyasa and he had to do. So, so yeah, you can make, I mean, and, and, and I see people, especially and I think that's where there's kind of all these different types of where there's yoga for like exercise versus yoga, which is a connection between our body and our breath and our, and, and, and our spirit. Um, and that's where the overemphasis kind of, kind of takes place. But I teach sometimes and um, even, even friends in a class that I'm teaching with friends who are more used to a power yoga will try to anticipate what I'm going to say next and put, and, and, and like, and they're, and they're jumping all over it. And I just want to be like, take a beat. Like you don't even, you know, I mean, just, just, just move, like, let, like, let, let, let your ears hear what you're supposed to do first and then, and then move. And so people are, and that's, it's really in their mind and just this anticipation, but yeah, there's, there's, I, I hope that's a, the, between those two examples, there's kind of an extreme one of just mm -hmm. this only like only a power practice and that's, and that's all they know. And then kind of, a. a um, I don't want to say an inability, but difficulty kind of being present with a, with a practice just as it is, um, you know, based on wanting to make it harder and wanting to make it, you know, exercise over um, connection. I think Michael Broad <clears throat> wrote a book called The Science of Yoga, and he talks about the number of injuries that people went to ER from yoga practice. You think, how is that even possible? But it said, off too often is that aggressiveness and pushing toward the limit. <clears throat> and what I have always said is when you find that initial point of tension, pause and become, approach it with curiosity, gentleness, and, and kindness that the body releases uh, not through aggressiveness, but through a sense of safety. Mm -hmm. So you've got to create safety in the body. And that's another reason too is you know, that support equals release. So propping is another way to allow the body to, to let go of all its clinging and it's all its tensions to the range of, you know, the possibilities of range of movement can be more further explored. And I think that's really hard in the West because it's like, it's like, you know, let's go for it, you know, let's make it happen. And that's how people get hurt. It is. And, you know, it also, I think, hurts um, a lot of exposure with with um, kind of with public safety personnel, because a lot of the yoga that they um, are initially exposed, it is it is on many, many occasions. I've talked to 
um, somewhat a, a police officer. And the only time they've ever done yoga has been in a hot yoga class, which is why I kind of made fun of it at the beginning of my presentation, a class in, in a hundred degree room. Everyone's just dripping with sweat. I don't particularly like it, although I swear it kind of helped me fix my shoulder once it being intentional with the extra, with the extra heat. But um, so people get in there and, and I've hurt my hip, you know, so I've, I've helped a shoulder being intentional and I've hurt a hip being unintentional in hot yoga because it warms up your body and you overextend, um, a, you know, a leg or your thigh, you know, any of these things. And so, yeah, there's a ton, especially in hot yoga, there are a ton of injuries. And um, when people, that's their only exposure is, you know, a power class in a hundred degree room. It's like, no, 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 no. And so you have to, I, I've, frequently have talked to people who they're like, that was nothing like the class that I took before. And I liked it so much better. And, um, it, and it's nice. And that's why I just feel lucky to be able to even do that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Katie. Well, we have just really just about a minute. So if there are any burning questions, anybody has been holding back, now would be your time if you have a question for Katie or a comment about the practice that you've done before we close for this evening. Good to see you, David and Troy. Well, we can't put mes messages in the chat tonight. Only to the, my chat says only to John. So oh, really? I can't tell you, I can't tell you. Thank you oh, very yeah. much. <laughs> it, was a, it was really um, in, the, I, I enjoyed the yoga, but I enjoyed the conversation a lot afterwards, talking about about because it was um, it was very interesting to notice the tension, especially in in my backs, my thighs, and then to recognize the other parts that were. I don't know that I've ever done that before, so thank you. Well, that comment made my night because I love it when something's like, you know, when there's just this basic thing in our body and it's like, oh, that was new. I complimented John a couple of weeks ago because I was like that hook at the bottom and hook at the top, you know, felt like new sensations in my body. So I think anytime we get to kind of um, surprise ourselves and in, in, in our body that that's pretty cool. Great presentation, Katie. I, I have to say this was the third session of yoga I've had the last two days over Zoom, and this was it's been a progression. It's get, it gets better and better, and the best part was the tensing up everything and then releasing. I, I was I felt the most ease of uh, of the last two days. So thank you for that. And that's another one of those things. It's so easy to do any anytime, anywhere, and so um, you know, keep those in mind. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Katie. Great job.